Northern New England is the oldest place in the nation on average, meaning more and more workers are retiring. And what that means is that uh, workers are able to find jobs, but employers are having more and more trouble in replacing many of their workers. From the New England News Collaborative, this is Next. Today we'll talk about the impacts of an aging workforce and how we live as we age. An investigation finds the majority of residential care facilities in Vermont are providing inadequate care. Where are you going to find a place that is safe? Most elderly people prefer to live at home. The Village to Village Network helps make that possible for some. We help each other so that the people who are the volunteers and provide the care and the assistance to people are also the people who receive them. And we meet four people over the age of 100. I never thought I would get to this point. It's Next. Next is produced at Connecticut Public Radio and is powered by the New England News Collaborative, eight public media companies coming together to tell the story of a changing region with support from the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. I'm Jane Lindholm, host of Vermont Edition on Vermont Public Radio. Thanks for joining us. As the U.S. population continues to age, three states in New England are growing older even faster. Maine has the oldest population in the country. The average age in Maine is nearly 45. That's followed closely by New Hampshire and Vermont. Barry Bluestone is an economist and professor emeritus of public policy at Northeastern University in Boston. He says an aging workforce is pushing employers to look for replacements as people retire. But unemployment is low, well below what economists consider full employment. And what that means is that uh, workers are able to find jobs, but uh, employers are having more and more trouble year after year in replacing many of their workers, particularly the skilled workers, but even workers in um, what we would consider jobs that don't require more than a high school degree or maybe community college. Is there an industry that we can point to that's hit especially hard by a retiring workforce? Well, uh, manufacturing is one that we normally don't think about because we think, well, manufacturing is declining uh, in numbers and therefore we should be easily able to fill it. Uh, But if you look at some of the occupations in manufacturing, you, you understand that the number of openings because of retirements is going to be absolutely enormous. I'll give you an example. If you look at machinists in Massachusetts, where I live, we only expect about 15 new jobs, new jobs per year over the next decade. But because of retirements, we'll have to fill over 1,130 new jobs each year. So for every one net new job, we've got 75 openings as a result of, for the most part, retirements. Uh, Food prep workers, the ratio of openings due to retirement versus the net job growth, 24 to 1. What's the solution then from a business owner's perspective? Well, in the past, we've been able to fill many of these jobs uh, through people who move into our state or who come from other countries. Uh, So, for example, uh, if we looked at the United States across the board... About 17% of our current workforce are foreign born. In healthcare, it's even higher, 19%. Uh, for a long time, of course, we had open immigration. We had many people coming here who could fill those jobs, and that made it easier for firms to hire workers to fill those jobs. Now, with restrictions on immigration, uh, this is going to pose a real problem for, for employers. On the other side, what we need to do is to make sure that we have expanded training opportunities for young people and even equally important, training opportunities so that people can change occupations when they're mature workers, when they're adult workers. If that's not enough or we don't succeed, New England doesn't succeed in those kinds of strategies, might the solution for businesses be out-migration? Absolutely, and that's the concern that business has and I think um, our governments have, our state governments. If we get to a point where businesses find it so difficult to replace their workforces here, they're going to think about going to places where there's a ready supply of labor. Of course, the problem is that when industry moves out of New England, 
uh, it's going to have an adverse effect on our entire economy because uh, not only will you have these companies moving as people retire, but that will also mean that their current employees are going to lose their jobs and unemployment would go up among younger people because of that. Not only that, but presumably there are going to be jobs that are necessary to care for and address the needs of an aging population that can't really move out of the region if the aging population remains in the region. Those jobs will still be needed whether or not they can be filled. Absolutely. The need for home health aides, the need for licensed practical nurses, for medical assistance. Again, these are are occupations that are critical to the well-being of our population. They're critical to the well-being, particularly of the aging population, uh, and yet the expected projected openings in these fields are anywhere up to 10 times as many as the net job growth we expect in those fields. We do see a lot of people working past what would traditionally have been assumed to be retirement age. You yourself worked past a traditional retirement age. So do you see that becoming more of an appealing characteristic of the aging demographic or one that's done out of need? A lot of people can't afford to retire. And how can we accommodate an aging workforce staying in the workforce? Well, you know, as as we have a healthier population, as people feel that they can work longer, uh, they do. I, I just retired at the age of 74. Um, of course, I'm in an occupation that doesn't take a lot of uh, physical strength as a professor at a university. But when you think about other jobs uh, that require a lot of physical activity, these are jobs that take their toll on people over life. And for them, even if they want to work longer, they may not be able to continue to work in the fields where they've worked before, and therefore they'll try and transition to occupations uh, that require less physical exertion. I want to ask you one other question, Barry, because, you know, this sounds kind of doom and gloom or, or, you know, fairly depressing to think about when we look at the demographics and the needs and how they don't line up very well. Is there a silver lining in a much older or aging workforce or anything that you see that we could hold on to as a shred of optimism? Well, there is one silver lining that's really good, and that is that as employers work to find a d- new workers to replace their retiring workers, they're forced to begin to raise wages and increase uh, earnings for younger workers. And we've already seen this happening in many of our states, including New Hampshire and Vermont, uh, Maine, and Massachusetts uh, last year. We had about a 4.5% increase in average wages, higher than we've had in decades. So the silver lining is the young workforce that is looking for jobs will find them easily. But more than that, with this kind of pressure to hire, wages and earnings and perhaps benefits will begin to increase for working families who in the past have had to struggle on lower wages with few benefits. Barry Bluestone is an economist and professor emeritus of public policy at Northeastern University in Boston. Professor Bluestone, thank you very much for talking with us. I'm very pleased to do so. One of the huge questions we all face as we grow older is, where are we going to live? In assisted living or a nursing home where there's access to more specialized care, or in our own homes? As Bluestone mentioned in our interview, we're facing a labor shortage among health care workers, which can affect the quality of care in assisted living and residential care homes. A four-month investigation into these facilities by Vermont Public Radio and Seven Days, an independent alt-weekly newspaper, revealed troubling patterns of inadequate care in Vermont. At least five residents have died and dozens have faced injuries and indignities over the last few years, and regulators have struggled to hold facilities accountable. In collaboration with Andrea Suazo and Derek Brower of Seven Days, VPR's Emily Corwin reports. Marilyn Kelly was a gutsy, independent woman. But the 78-year-old wasn't making safe decisions. And so, in May 2015, her children, including her daughter June Kelly, moved Marilyn into a residential care home called Our House 2. It was just, it was like a calamity of errors one right after the other. June doesn't mean a comedy of errors. She means a calamity. Seven months after moving in, a staff member assaulted Marilyn. And a month after that, she died. Marilyn's care isn't an easy subject for June. 
It comes with a lot of grief and guilt. She tells me her mom had been active, going fishing, taking walks. But when she and her sisters visited our house, they would find her tired, sometimes in a stupor. We're sitting here thinking it's the dementia. I mean, I, I literally am um, having conversations. Is she changing that much from the dementia? June says the facility's staff said yes, it's the dementia. But it wasn't. According to her medical records, Marilyn was on an antipsychotic called Haldol. It's a sedative that's not approved by the FDA for treating agitation in dementia patients, in part because it increases the risk of death. Nevertheless, three times a day for 50 days, our house staff crushed the medication and put it in her food and drink, according to court filings. June, Marilyn's legal guardian, says she had no idea. There was no discussion about putting mom on Haldol. There was no discussion about the implications of what Haldol would do to our loved one. It was not like nothing. There were other red flags, too. Despite paying $6,000 a month for her care, June says her mom was often unbathed. She even had a tooth go rotten. And though June wanted to move her mom somewhere else, she says it was frustrating trying to vet the alternatives. I said to my friend, I go, where are you going to find a place that is safe? And she's like, it's everywhere. I'm like, this is ridiculous. Since 2014, the state has cited a majority of Vermont's care homes for serious infractions. That's just one finding from the more than 10,000 pages of records which VPR and Seven Days reviewed. We found staffing and training were frequently inadequate. We found residents whose well-known but unmet needs led to preventable injury and death. We found facilities often repeated the same violations inspection after inspection, yet the state rarely used its authority to issue fines. And we learned at least five residents have died in accidents related to substandard care since 2014. That's according to the state's own records. In one Burlington facility, two seniors died just three months apart after wandering outside in the middle of the night. One was locked out and got frostbite. The other tripped and broke his spine. A resident in South Burlington suffocated between a bed and a railing that was configured wrong. And in a Waterbury facility, a man with severe mental illness died from heat stroke. He was wearing multiple layers of clothing during a heat wave in a facility with no air conditioning. I'm concerned. I'm disappointed. State Rep. Ann Pugh chairs the House Human Services Committee. She says she worries regulators don't have the resources they need to sufficiently protect residents. This is clearly concerning and clearly something that deserves and needs some legislative attention and oversight. When bad things happen, it's up to the Department of Disabilities, Aging, and Independent Living to step in. Commissioner Monica Hutt oversees Vermont's 133 assisted living and residential care homes. Globally, I think we, as a, as a department, as a state, we can always do more and do better in terms of regulation and quality. But that's what we strive to do is to do more and to do better. Um, that just goes without saying. There's no system that's perfect. Nursing homes are tightly regulated by the feds. But these care homes are state regulated. And the regs are minimal. Licensing Chief Pam Coda is in charge of enforcement at all Vermont long-term care facilities. She says it's assisted living and residential care homes that keep her up at night. I've been making notes about what we need regulations on and what we haven't been able to capture and situations that have left me frustrated as the licensing chief, not being able to hold someone accountable to what we need from them. The state has begun the process of rewriting the regulations. Although today, regulators do already have the ability to fine care homes. June Kelly, Marilyn's daughter, is a former police officer and investigator. And after everything that happened to her mom, she started doing research. She found an unsearchable, unordered list of PDFs buried on a state website, inspection reports. They would cite all these medication errors that these care homes are doing, and they have the ability to find them so much per day, but there wasn't, I wasn't seeing any fines. The state has only issued six fines since 2014. June wants to see someone hold our house accountable. Her family is suing the home 
and the providers who oversaw Marilyn's care. Paula Patorti, the owner of our house, wouldn't comment on the allegations. But she says this. We're almost 19 years old, and I'm still as passionate today as I've always been about the work that we do and the way that we do it. And yet a staff member assaulted Marilyn Kelly in her facility. Months after her daughter June says Marilyn was put back on Haldol, a caretaker at our house pushed the 78-year-old to the floor in a hallway and abandoned her there. The whole thing was caught on a security camera. Court records show administrators knew the employee had been acting out before the incident, but kept her on. The employee was convicted of assault. I don't, I don't like to think that I even fault this person. I just think that they weren't cut out for caregiving. The state substantiated allegations of abuse and neglect at the facility, but our house was never fined. According to the lawsuit, two weeks after the assault, back at our house too, Marilyn's children found their mom unattended to on a couch in a hallway. She was unresponsive and struggling to breathe. They rushed her to the hospital where she died. June says she's telling her family's story because she wants more transparency and more accountability. For the New England News Collaborative, I'm Emily Corwin. Since this series was first published late last year, the state of Vermont has agreed to make some changes to its regulations. We've asked Emily Corwin to stick around and talk about those proposed changes and the VPR and Seven Days investigation. Emily, welcome back to Next. Good to be here. So as we heard in the story we just listened to, you actually found a pattern of inadequate care at these facilities with at least five deaths and more injuries. So how did you work to make that information more accessible through your investigation? Some of the documents that we were reviewing, the inspection reports, they were public in that they were supposed to be being posted online, and many of them were, but not all of them. These documents are required to be posted at the time that they come out in the facility themselves. So, so you know, to people walking into these facilities at the time that that's the most recent inspection, they could have looked at it. Um, but in aggregate, it was v- almost impossible to review what was going on in these facilities. So we uh, scraped those from the web. We requested the one in five that were missing and uh, manually inputted the, that information, all 2,000 citations that each facility, uh, there's about 133 of them, um, had received over roughly five years. And then we did the same thing for complaints. Complaints were not made public in any way, and they were heavily redacted. And we were able to request them, um, review them, and also input those documents into our database. And that database now, Emily, is actually accessible to anybody else who wants to find it? That's right. Andrea Suazo actually created an outward-facing interface so that the public can go in and search for each facility or facilities by location, and they can see how these facilities compare in their track record. They can instantly access the inspection reports and get the details about what has happened in each of these facilities. Now, you and Derek also used this information from the database and the the stuff that you had done this manual work on to do some investigative reporting. And one of the things that you found is that inadequate care is connected to staffing issues. Can you talk a little bit about that? As anyone in New England knows, uh, we've got low unemployment rates, especially in Vermont. We've got an aging population, especially in Vermont, and that leads to really severe staffing shortages in a lot of industries. And that hits long-term care really hard. Um, And in Vermont, regulations uh, require really minimum training for staffers. There's no real age limit. And so caretakers um, often are, you know, very young. Also, we found that nearly one in three facilities have actually been cited for failing to maintain their background check records um, or abuse registry records. They're required to do both of those things. And in one instance, a woman um, actually pleaded guilty to forging a check while at a facility, kept that job, moved on to other jobs in the same field, and continued to steal from residents. Emily, can you talk a little bit, though, about the difference between whether it's just a sort of an inadequate screening process that leads to people who shouldn't be doing this work, doing the work, or if there's something more systemic about an understaffing or chronically underfunded and understaffed 
situation for long-term uh, residential caregivers? There's something systemic going on. You know, these jobs don't pay livable wages. Many caretakers are making $11 an hour working, you know, many shifts in a row, during which time uh, they often don't have time to eat. We've heard people talk about, you know, shoving uh, food into their mouth while they're going to help patients and residents with their daily needs. Experts told us uh, that, that these conditions actually lead to bad care, to moral lapses, to abuse and neglect. Susan Weary, who's a geriatric psychiatrist, she's also a former commissioner um, of our Department of Aging and Disabilities here. She emphasized the way that our culture really stigmatizes elders and it stigmatizes people with cognitive decline like dementia. And then it undervalues, you know, quote unquote, pink jobs, which are, you know, the caregiving that's often done by women and by immigrants in our society. And, you know, she really emphasize to us how important it is to consider the really systemic way that those things influence, you know, Medicaid reimbursement rates, low wages, um, and the conditions that uh, create abuse and neglect in these kinds of facilities. So given that, the Vermont Department that oversees these care facilities has announced that it's actually going to delay a rulemaking process so it can take your investigation into account and make adjustments. Do you have a sense of what that might mean in terms of regulations? Uh, you know, we weren't provided with a lot of detail, but Commissioner Monica Hutt um, of Dale, the Department of Aging and Independent Living, um, she did specify uh, that specifically they were rethinking the rules around administrator training. Just to give you a little background inf information, you know, while the feds require a thousand hours of supervised training for nursing home administrators before they sit for exams, the only thing that's required uh, for these facilities presently is, you know, these administrators have to take a 24-hour self-guided online course that's just administrated by a trade organization. They want to rethink that. And also, they're interested in rethinking these um, waivers. And we didn't get to talk much about this, but it's essentially a system by which people who need more serious kinds of caretaking, who would usually be in a nursing home, are able to get a waiver to stay in a residential care home. And a lot of people do this. And it means that you know many people are being cared for in a facility that's really not licensed to provide that level of care. And so that's another thing that... Um, Monica Hutt said that they are reconsidering after our reporting. Emily, your investigation was limited to Vermont, but do you have a sense of how this is playing out in other states? Vermont is definitely not an outlier. We don't have uh, data about other New England states, but nationally, um, though our statute's 20 years old, uh, it actually goes further to protect residents than, than many other states do. Um, the Oregonian in Oregon and the Atlanta Journal-Constitution in Georgia both did similar investigations to Seven Days and VPRs here in Vermont, and, and they found you know very similar outcomes at their residential care homes or equivalents. Um, so this is definitely uh, an issue that goes beyond Vermont's borders. Emily Corwin is an investigative reporter for Vermont Public Radio. Thank you very much for sharing your investigation with us. Thanks, Jane. Coming up, living situations that seem to work for senior citizens. We'll visit a private home where people live communally and an organization that helps people stay in their homes as they age. It's next. Next is made possible in part by our founding supporters, who believe in the power of collaborative news coverage, including the Common Sense Fund, supporting the New England News Collaborative and its coverage of climate change and the evolving clean energy economy. Support also comes from Douglas Stone and Mary Schwab Stone through the Smart Family Foundation of New York. This is Next. I'm Jane Lindholm. In Randolph, Vermont, there's a private home where up to 20 older people can live together. Erica Heilman, host of the podcast Rumble Strip, has the story of Jocelyn House. Quiet around here this morning. People haven't gotten up yet. That's Becky and Millie before breakfast at the Jocelyn House in Randolph. Breakfast is at 8. <laughs> Oh dear, I'm in the middle of the way here. People often assume that Jocelyn House is a nursing home, probably because a lot of old people live there. But it's not a nursing home. It's not assisted living. 
There's no anonymous art, no hand sanitizer mounted on the walls. There are no rules posted anywhere. It's not licensed by the state. It's a house. It's a place where up to 20 older people live independently together in a huge, elegant house furnished with their own things. There's socializing when you want it, silence when you don't. There's sociable silence. There are three beautiful meals served every day. Residents are given a room, and rent is $1,500 a month. Becky and Arlene, the managers of the house, provide loving care and attention, but no medical services. If residents need extra help, they hire in nurses, and there are a couple nurses who visit the house regularly. Nancy's waiting for her scrambled eggs. The Jocelyn House isn't the only shared living place for old people in the state of Vermont. There are a handful Arlene and Al Wright started the Jocelyn House in 1992 with Randolph Neighborhood Housing. Now they're in their 80s, and they still live up on the third floor. Their daughter, Becky, manages the house now, and she lives upstairs, too. Here's Arlene talking about the beginnings of Jocelyn House. I mean, it was a real risk to start with. And there were, you know, the first few months you thought, you are nuts. (laughs) You are nuts to have done this. You started with an empty house. We just brought up our own furniture and our own dishes and pots and pans and uh, all that sort of thing. And the, the day we opened, one per, we went and, and they, we went and got this lady <laughs> and her furniture and brought her here. So the first morning, we had one lady in the house. Al and I and one lady. <laughs> And we were having breakfast in the kitchen. (laughs) You wouldn't believe how within two or three weeks we had five or six. So we put dining room, a table in the dining room, and they moved to the dining room. And then it just, by the end of not too many months, less than a year, uh, we had 16 people here. Unbelievable. It was overwhelming because, you know, you had to clean and cook and and shop and plan meals, and you didn't really know anything about it, <laughs> you know? We did, it was just kind of trial and error. Hi, Raylene. How are you? I'm wonderful. How are you? Good. Hmm? A little frosty this morning, but we're going to get through it. Yeah, we're going to get through it. Here's Arlene's daughter, Becky. I'll see people at the grocery store or something that... I know, you know, that they're living alone, and I know different people that are living alone, and it's isolation is not good. The biggest detriment to the elderly, I think, is isolation. I wouldn't be good at it at all. No. Was somebody sitting here reading this paper? No, no? you can sit right down. This is today's oh, paper. Down What's down. this here? That's yesterday's. Oh, well, so. we don't want to read the old ones. I'll well, get, no means. I'll get the old ones put Better away. Put away. Yep. Okay. Okay. Here's Arnold in his third week at Jocelyn House. People my age, they never, they never know how difficult it is to be in a, an apartment for years at a time and you have nobody to talk to. I needed some place where I could meet people of my own age, and this Joslyn house was, I think, the answer to my prayer. Even though people would look at me and they'd say, What's he doing here? <laughs> He looks like 55, 60 years old. (laughs) And I said, I'm 82. I can't help it that I have my own hair. I can't help it. (laughs) This is Donna. I have lost two husbands, one in 81 and one in 90. Terrible to go through. Can't imagine... So I'm alone. Here I am. You're living in a house alone. That was awful. That was pure awful. Why? 
lonesome, nobody to talk to or nothing. It was awful. I had a beautiful home, but Jesus, sit down at night and watch TV and uh, boring. It's awful to cook for yourself. It's an awful job. But it's been wonderful here. I, I like it here very much. I don't want to go home and live alone again. Do you more things? Uh huh. People will come in and say, this feels like home. It's very homey. And I'm sure it's just because of the everyday kind of furnishings, the the love that you that goes into the house. I think that does reflect on the feeling of the house. How about that? Prince Harry and Meghan to take a step back. Why are they stepping back? They look awful happy, the two kids. Leave them alone. <clears throat> oh, you got that, honey? Yeah. That's an awful reach for you. Thank you very much, though. You're... I'll try not to kick it again. I got long arms. You got long arms? Yeah. Yeah, you have for a little girl. <laughs> Poor Millie. It really brings out the best in people to be together and to be safe and to be and to be listened to. Yeah. Love is very evident. Yeah. Yeah. They do love one another, yeah, yeah. And I love them, <laughs> yeah. That story was produced by Erica Heilman, the host of the podcast Rumble Strip. You can find a longer version of the story at rumblestripvermont.com. Most Americans prefer to age in place meaning as they get older, they want to keep living at home. But keeping up a home with the cleaning, cooking, and snow shoveling can get harder as people age. Our next guest, though, is able to live at home with the help of Home Haven. It's one of dozens of organizations in the Northeast, and at least 200 in the U.S. and Australia, that connect older people with volunteers through the Village to Village network. These volunteers can take them on doctor's visits, go grocery shopping, or just sit and chat if they're lonely. Fred O'Brien is 73 and president of the Home Haven Board. Fred, thanks for coming on next. Oh, sure. So tell me a little bit about yourself and your living situation. Well, I live with my wife in Orange, Connecticut. Um, We've been married for 40 years. We met in Berkeley, California, and um, when Home Haven uh, came into sight on the horizon here in New Haven... My wife immediately recognized that it was a chance to recapture the communal lifestyle that we knew in Berkeley. When you started thinking about Home Haven, were you thinking about that communal lifestyle and that idea of finding ways to have a community, but also ways as you get older to make sure that you're still doing and getting what you need and want? Well, one of the things that was real clear to us is, as baby boomers, we were going to swamp all the government-available modes of assistance for the elderly, and uh, that unless we were able to make common cause and work together in a sort of self-help arrangement, that we would probably be in very bad shape in terms of having the services we need and being able to afford to be alive. So how does Home Haven and other organizations like this around the country and in other countries as well help bridge that gap or fill that need that you see? I don't think there's any other organizations that do what we do because we are – we're not a, built on a commercial model. We're a nonprofit, and we help each other so that the people who are the volunteers and provide the care and the assistance to people are also the people who receive them. And it's a very synergistic arrangement. What we do is allow people to stay in their homes and cope individually uh, with assistance if they need help with rides to doctor's appointments, uh, help balancing their checkbooks. We provide an organic and community-based solution to these problems for as long as possible. Obviously, not everybody can stay in their homes until the end of their lives. But if you could stay 10 more years in your home, 
It would both save you a tremendous amount of money and also preserve your lively participation in your community. Well, Fred, as you mentioned many times, the members are also providing these volunteer services. Can you give me an example of that in your village? Well, we have a list of drivers, some of whom are members of the Home Haven group and some of whom are just simply um, helpful uh, outsiders who will provide automobile transportation for people who can't drive anymore. So the way I understand it is basically you pay dues. I think it's about $900 a year at this point, And in exchange, you have access to these other services. And some of them are social, like the visiting committee and the greeting committee. Are there also social events as well? Oh, there are social, artistic, cultural, and uh, recreational events. We have a group that meets to read plays together. We have uh, a memoir writing group. Actually, we have several of them. You said at the beginning of our conversation that part of what motivated you to join this and become part of a a village-to-village movement was because you wanted to recreate some of the things that you really valued about your younger life in Berkeley. I realize that I'm also speaking to the president of the board, so you're representing the organization, but does it do for you what you hoped? No, it does something different. Um, Despite the, um, the... motivation that I might have had or that my wife and I might have had, uh, there's no way that being 70 years old is – you can't duplicate what it was like when you were 25. Uh, But being inspired and being uh, engaged and being aware of what other people are thinking and doing, uh, that's, that's part of remaining vital and remaining engaged in the world. And uh, certainly if all you do is watch TV and read the newspaper, uh, the view you have of the world is extremely um, depressing. Uh, Whereas if you actually meet real people and talk to them and share your thoughts and concerns with them, that revitalizes you whether you're 25 or 70. And do you believe you'll be able to stay in your home longer than you might have otherwise? Um. Well, yeah. I mean, there are three flights of stairs in our house, and it's a, uh, the building's 130 years old. Uh, and sometimes uh, running up and down those stairs, I feel like I'm 130 years old. <laughs> but, uh, you know, we take it one day at a time and one month at a time, and uh, we try and keep our uh, bodies as fit as they will uh, allow us to at this age. And uh, so far, so good. That was Fred O'Brien, president of the Home Haven Board, which is part of the Village to Village Network. Coming up, we hear from people over the age of 100 about how the world has changed in their lifetimes. And we'll get their advice on living life well. It's next. Next is made possible in part by our founding supporters, who believe in the power of collaborative news coverage, including the John Merck Fund, supporting the New England News Collaborative and its coverage of climate and clean energy. Alfreda Dumond is 102 years old. She remembers the Acadian culture and rural lifestyle that defined her childhood in a rustic county, Maine. But as the world around her has changed, Dumond continues to look to the future. Maine Public Radio's Robbie Feinberg has her story. Alfreda Dumond doesn't have any secrets for longevity. At 102, draped with a big necklace and earrings, she's still surprised that she's made it this far. I never thought I would get to this point, to that age. Oh, no, that's a surprise for me. Dumond lives in a nursing home in Fort Kent, the same town where she grew up. She remembers her family's big house in the country, surrounded by chickens and cows. When I was young, we used to go to pick berries, blueberries and strawberries. They don't have that good taste anymore. This is the best taste, those small ones. We used to go, my mom, and we'd get ready in the morning early, and we'd pick up probably the quarts of blueberries and strawberries. At home, they'd enjoy simple pleasures. My uh, brother 
he loves to dance. And he, would, he would go and get some of those big records and put them on there. And, and me, I always love music. So he'd take me and we'd dance together, you know, on the record. <laughs> I can't say that we didn't live a good life. My mother never was a person that would ask for more. She was thankful all the time, thankful for what I have. But at age 17, the Great Depression hit, and Dumont left for Connecticut to find work. She got a job at a hospital and didn't return to Fort Kent for nearly a decade. But then she became seriously ill. She developed a lesion on her lung and was sent to a sanitarium in Presque Isle. Dumont told her doctor that she thought her life was over. Dad, I, no, I said, I think I'm going to die. <laughs> and he said, no, no, you won't die. But he says, I gave you one year, two years, three years, four years, and five years. If you do exactly what I tell you, he says, you could get out probably a little earlier. So I said, okay, what do you want me to do? He says, just lay down quiet. Eat your meals. I said, I'm going to do that. For three years, her life barely stretched beyond the walls of the sanitarium. Dumont says she followed the doctor's advice. She also prayed a lot. The experience helped define her outlook on life, which she still follows today. I don't live for the, what's gone by. me. I live what's coming, the future, and the future of a good future. Not long after she was released from the sanitarium, a friend of Dumont's family stopped by their house in Fort Kent. Soon after they met, he asked her on a date. I met him in May, and uh, we got married in August. (laughs) They raised seven kids in Aroostook County and now have 17 grandkids. Dumont says as the decades have passed, she's seen northern Maine change. She laments the lack of work that's forced many young people to leave. And she worries about the future of the Acadian culture and language that were so prevalent in her youth. Yeah, the culture's changed with the French. But at my time, when we used to go to, ch- to school, uh, we couldn't talk French. They would push you to talk English. But our, our culture was French. So we talked French. We didn't know how to talk English. <laughs> so I learned my English when I went, to, when I went away. Her daughter Linda tells her that she wished she'd pushed harder to preserve the language. It should have been my children's first language. I didn't appreciate it till I was a little older, realizing how what a gift I had. Every time I talked to them, they would answer me in English. I talked to them in French. Answer me in English. She did the same thing. I would say, answer me French. You know, I would say that. (laughs) But despite the changes that she's seen, Dumond is content. At the nursing home, she wakes up at 5.30 each morning, exercises, and says her prayers. And at age 102, decades removed from the most difficult years of her life, Dumont says she now feels at peace. For the New England News Collaborative, I'm Robbie Feinberg. That story is part of a series on centenarians, people over 100, from Maine Public Radio. Let's listen to another story from that series. It's about three dots. Now, this has nothing to do with ellipses or new discoveries in the solar system or locations on a map. These three dots are three women named Dorothy who grew up together in the same hometown, celebrated their 100th birthdays this past year, and still remain friends. Here's Susan Sharon from Maine Public Radio. Back in 1919, Dorothy was the third most popular girl's name, and the chance of living to age 100 was 1.9%. So imagine the odds that former classmates and longtime friends Dot Buchanan, Dot Murray, and Dot Kern would still be living in Auburn, Maine, and ten decades later, meeting for tea. Looks like we made it. I, I, we have don't you so think, far. Don't you think as though, that we look as though we're going to make it? Sitting on the sofa in Dot Buchanan's living room, the three great-grandmothers squeeze hands. Their hair is thinner, and it's more difficult for them to get around. But they say they find comfort in their extended families and in their unusual connection that brings them together to reminisce a couple of times a year. We all went through the Depression, 
and uh, no one had any more than the other. Growing up in the late 1920s and early 30s, Dot Murray says economic times were tough, but everyone made do. We couldn't spend much, that's all. Murray had a fondness for Depression-era pickle sandwiches. That's sweet pickles with mayonnaise on bread. And she loved socializing, still does, at family gatherings and parties with her friends. Dot Buchanan recalls Murray as a striking drum majorette in the high school marching band. She had big boobs. And she I, you, did, you did. And you'd go back and forth and back and forth. And you were really very good. Dot Kern is the youngest of the three. I don't feel any older than I did when I was 16. Really, yes. truly. Kern is a graduate of Bates College who worked as a reporter for the student newspaper and then at the Lewiston Sun Journal, where she and her husband met. During World War II, he served in the Army. They wrote letters to each other every day for four years. Kern says after the war was over, he called to say that he was coming home and she should meet him at the bottom of their hill that night. But when the time came, Kern says she got lost in her excitement. And I walked right by him, and he hauled and said, Dot, I must have been in seventh heaven, and and, and I thought, how could I have missed him? (laughs) She went on to earn a second degree in library science from Colby College and worked as a high school librarian, a job she loved, for 20 years. Dot Murray had a bank job and later helped her husband run his business. And Dot Buchanan was an executive secretary at the American Red Cross during World War II. She remembers the sound of the teletype ticking off war casualties, always fearful that it could include the name of her husband who was stationed in Hawaii or someone else she knew. Like both Kern and Murray, Buchanan was a working mother. After the war, that was when women were liberated and they started working. But I liked it. Everything I did, I always liked All three women enjoy reading and music. Murray plays the piano by ear and singing, although Dot Kern says she was sorry to have to give up her participation in the church choir earlier this year. There was concern that she might take a fall. All three are also guided by their faith. And you just wonder sometimes, well, why? Why me? Why am I living so long? When the dots get together, they say they always ask each other the same question. How are you feeling? (laughs) (laughs) And they say they're feeling fine, especially Dot Murray. I don't have an ache or a pain. I drive. I do everything, as I always have. Why does the police let you drive it? Because I not, haven't had any accidents. Well, yeah, but you, they, can't, you're they can't stop me. You do. I'm, I'm still an excellent driver. I didn't say you weren't. Giving up driving has been difficult, the other two dots admit, and both did so reluctantly. No one wants to lose their independence or be a burden to their families. That's their number one concern. Getting to the advanced age of 100, they say, means giving up a lot. They've outlived husbands, friends, siblings, and even several of their children. And they have some sage advice for the rest of us. Dot Kern says she's been surprised by the passage of time. Time has gone fast. It doesn't slow down and get drab. It goes fast. Her wish is that everyone would slow down, pay attention to the planet, and deal with climate change. Dot Buchanan yearns for tolerance. Accept other people for what they are. Accept them for their true being, because everybody's not alike. Dot Murray has a similar wish. She's concerned about polarizing political views in the country and the direction she sees it headed. Get along. Love one another. And then, glancing at Dot Buchanan's little dog Jody resting on the living room floor, Murray adds, you know... Everyone should have a dog. For the New England News Collaborative, I'm Susan Sharon. That's our show this week. Thanks for tuning in. You can find us wherever you get your podcasts. Just search Next New England. Next is produced by Morgan Springer. Vanessa De La Torre is our executive editor. The executive producer is Katie Talarski. We had help this week from Chris Albertine, Jonathan McNichol, and Michael Garth. Music this week is by Todd Merrill, Goodnight Blue Moon, and Jimily and Wise Old Moon. I'm Jane Lindholm.
The New England News Collaborative is powered by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, Connecticut Public Radio, Vermont Public Radio, New Hampshire Public Radio, Maine Public Radio, New England Public Radio, WBUR, WSHU, and The Public's Radio. Thank you.